All right, this uh, podcast is going to be about enzymes in the Level 2 Biology book. This is Section 2-4, and this is the final section about biochemistry that we're going to be learning about. So just a few basics here. Uh, a chemical reaction, you guys have this definition uh, in your notes. Uh, a chemical reaction is you're taking the reactants, which is what goes into a reaction, and changing them into products. If you look down here at the second bullet, what does that actually mean? Uh, chemical reactions involve changes in the chemical bonds that join atoms in the compounds. So you're rearranging chemical bonds to do these chemical reactions. And remember, the way atoms interact with each other is all dependent on that outer shell of electrons, and those are called valence electrons. We learned about that with carbon, we learned about it with oxygen, they want to have that valence shell full, and they will give away electrons, take on extra electrons, share electrons to make sure that outer shell gets full. So that's what chemical reactions are, changing reactants into products, and we rearrange some chemical bonds to do that. All right, so for chemical reactions to happen, the atoms involved have to collide in a very specific way. They have to be facing the right direction. They have to be going a certain speed. Um, and there's this stuff called this a concept called activation energy that has to be reached. <clears throat> well, for this to happen fast enough for us to stay alive, these molecules have to be bumping together at this certain speed, facing the right direction constantly. And that's not going to happen all by itself, just randomly. Um, you could raise the temperature. And that would make the molecules hit each other more often. You could stir the mixture. You could do things like that to try to get them to collide more often. But you really can't do that inside of a cell. You can't just raise your body temperature up to like 150 degrees to make the molecules hit each other more often in your body. So we're limited there. So there has to be another option to make chemical reactions happen fast enough to keep cells alive. And that option is enzymes. All right, so. Let me just pop all this stuff up here for you. Enzymes are proteins. Okay, they're not lipids, they're not carbs, they're not nucleic acids. They're proteins, so they're made of, a, of amino acids, and they're going to speed up how fast chemical reactions can happen. How do they do it? By doing these two things. They're going to bring the two molecules close together, facing the right way, and they're going to lower this initial energy here called activation energy that's needed for the reaction to occur. So enzymes are almost like mediators. They're going to bring the two molecules close together, facing the right way, so they can actually react with one another. Um, these allow chemical reactions to happen billions times faster than they normally would. Think about if you put some chicken nuggets out, how long would it take for those to decompose and turn into the amino acids that make up the proteins of that chicken meat? It would take years, maybe decades, for that just to break down with no enzymes. But you chew them up, use the enzymes in your body, you can digest the protein in those chicken nuggets in just a few hours. So we're taking something that would take years without enzymes and make it happen in a few hours with enzymes. So enzymes are keeping us alive. They are allowing us to do chemical reactions as fast as we need them to happen. All right, now you have some of this vocabulary, and let's just focus on this picture. We drew this in your notes, but this here is the enzyme. And there's an important part here called the active site, and it has a very specific shape to it. The active site is complementary to this thing, the substrate. So the substrate bumps into the active site just because they collide together. And then you have this enzyme substrate complex where chemical reactions are happening. Stuff's happening with this to make it into something different. And then it gets turned into products and released. The enzyme is unchanged. Okay, and it is able to go up and grab some more substrate and keep doing the reaction over and over and over again. So it's taken the reactant, which we now call a substrate, so we also call these reactants, and changing them into products, and the enzyme's the mediator for this. It's, it's allowing it to happen, and it's speeding up the process. I'm going to come back to this one. All right, the way that substrates fit into an enzyme's active site is super specific. It's just like a lock and a key. Picture the enzyme as the lock to your front door of your house, and the substrate is your key. 
your key has to have a super specific shape to actually go into your lock and turn the mechanism in there to let you get in. You can't use your neighbor's key in your lock because it won't, it won't fit. It's not the right shape. So this lock and key idea shows us how specific enzymes are to their substrate. And this is what we wrote down in class. Um, if you mess up the shape of the active site or if the substrate shape gets messed up, this interaction won't happen anymore and you won't be making any products. So these two shapes are very specific and it's called the lock and key theory to explain how specific enzymes are. We name enzymes by adding the suffix ASE, ACE, to the substrate name. So if we're going to break down sucrose, we need an enzyme called a sucrase to do it. If we want to break down lipids, we have some fats in our diet, we need something called a lipase to break those down. DNA gets broken down by a DNA, so you guys get the idea. You add ACE to the substrate's root word, and then you get the name of the enzyme that will react with that substrate. All right, now, enzymes can be slowed down and stopped because we don't always need them to be working. Enzymes have a very unique 3D shape, and down here at this picture, it looks like a big tangled ribbon, but that's a very unique 3D shape. Anything that messes with these different spirals and these different twists and bends of these, this is just an amino acid chain held together with peptide bonds. Anything that messes with this shape, we call that denaturing the protein. It's still made of the same exact amino acids in the same exact order, but it's lost this unique 3D shape. So now it won't work anymore. So denaturing a protein means changing the 3D shape. It's like taking the key to your house and smashing it with a hammer. You're changing that shape. It's not going to work anymore. Here's my analogy for this. Think about a slinky. A slinky has a very unique three-dimensional shape. That shape lets it go back and forth and go downstairs. If you take this shape and mess it up, it's still made of the same exact metal, but you've lost the shape. You've lost the function now. So now there's no function. You've got the same stuff, but the shape was so important that once you've lost that shape, you've lost its ability to do what it does. That's what an enzyme is. So this over here would be a, like a denatured slinky. Okay, Denatured means it's lost its three-dimensional shape. It's now ineffective. So how do we slow down and speed up or stop enzymes? One way is temperature. All right, If you look at this graph here, this enzyme works the best right around 37 degrees Celsius. That's our body temperature. That's 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. If you go above that, you will denature the enzyme. Okay, and that means it'll lose the 3D shape. And look at it. It comes off. It goes from its optimum rate down to nothing. It does nothing anymore because you've lost the 3D shape. You've messed up the slinky. If you cool the enzyme down, you go this way on the graph, what happens here is the molecules aren't bouncing around as often, so there's less collisions happening. That means the enzyme is not interacting with the substrates as much, and that's what this bullet's talking us about. This is why you have a refrigerator. All right, you're cooling down the enzymes and the decomposers so they can't break down your food quite as quickly anymore. So that's why we have a refrigerator, because it, it cools down our enzyme and it gives us less and less and less co uh, collisions. And the decomposers can't break down your food as quickly. Your food stays fresher longer. Higher temperatures will denature it. And this is one reason why we can cook things. And that will kill different parasites that might be on our food or in meat that we're eating or something like that. We're denaturing all of their enzymes. They can't function anymore. It's now safe to eat. Another way to influence the activity of enzymes is through pH. pH is how acidic a substance is. So this one seems to work really good at like a pH of 5. If you become less acidic and go this way, <clears throat> the enzyme's not going to work so well because it's very specific. If you become more acidic, it's also not going to work as well. So they're very particular. They need a certain pH range in order to be effective. All right, now this one's going to be uh, take a little bit of explaining, but the substrate concentration, look at this graph with me. Along the y-axis, we have how quickly the enzyme's working. Along the x-axis, we have how much substrate is there, the concentration of it. And if you look, as you 
increased substrate concentration, your enzyme activity goes up, but then look at it plateaus. You keep adding more and more substrate here. The concentration keeps getting higher and higher, but your enzyme's not working any faster. It's kind of trailed off. So why is that? Let me give you an analogy here. Think about waiting in line. Let's say you're at the bank and there's two tellers open. So one teller there and you got a teller here. And let's say there are four people in line. Well, the tellers can take their time. All right, they each help two people, they take their time, not a big deal. Let's say you get like 15 people in line, you guys get the idea. Well, now they're going to have to work as fast as they can because they want that line to go down. They don't want to have unhappy customers. So maybe the optimal rate for these two tellers working together, maybe they can help eight people every 10 minutes. That's their optimum rate. They can't physically work any faster. All right. It doesn't matter if the line goes out the door and wraps around the bank. They can only work this quickly. All right. So enzymes are sort of like people in that regard where they can only work so quickly just because there's more people in line doesn't mean they can work any faster. They're already maxed out working as fast as they can. That's what this graph shows us. Right here, the enzymes are working as fast as they can. It doesn't matter if you keep adding more and more substrate, they're already working as fast as possible. You can't make them work any faster. That's what this graph shows us. That's what I have here in the notes. Adding substrate allows the enzymes to reach their fastest rate if you keep adding it beyond their fastest rate, you won't make them work any faster. They're already working as fast as they can. You're just kind of creating a backlog. All right, it's just, it's just going to take time now. So that's another way to speed up enzymes. Give them more substrate to a point. You give them way too much, they max out, and then you just have to wait then because they're working as fast as they possibly can. All right, other ways to slow down enzymes. One way is to use competitive inhibitors. And let me show you what competitive inhibitors are. This is a competitive inhibitor. It's a molecule, and it's in blue here. It's a molecule that fits inside the enzyme's active site, but guess what? It, can't, it doesn't do anything. It's not made into products. It just kind of sits there and it blocks up the enzyme. Think about that ripping the paper activity. That blue paper, that was your competitive inhibitor. It got in your hands, jammed up your hands. You couldn't do anything with it. Sometimes these competitive inhibitors can leave, but if they're there, the substrate cannot get in. If the competitive inhibitor isn't there, well then yeah, of course the substrate can get in and get made into product, but they compete for the active site and they block it. That's why they're called competitive inhibitors. They're competing for the active site, they don't get altered, they don't get made into products, and as long as that inhibitor, if it's sitting in that active site, that enzyme is shut down. Okay? The other type of in inhibitor is called a non-competitive inhibitor. Now, this does not compete for the active site. This tries to bind somewhere else. Sometimes these are called allosteric inhibitors. It's just like a synonym for it that you might hear in a different book or on the keystone or something like that. Now, feel free to pause this. I'm going way too fast for you to write this, so pause it when you need to. But let me show you a picture of the non-competitive inhibitors. I'll skip some of this stuff. Okay. Non-competitive inhibitors do not go after the active site. They're not competing for this. They bind to another spot over here. It's called the regulatory, regulatory site or the allosteric site. All right. Once it binds in there, it causes the whole enzyme to change shape. So once this inhibitor gets in there, look at this picture. Now your active site doesn't have the same shape anymore. You've changed the shape of it because this is bound in here. The substrate can't fit. It's the wrong shape. So what happens? You shut the enzyme down. No uh, catalysis, we'll call it. Catalysis means speeding up the reaction. You can't speed up reactions anymore because the substrate doesn't fit into the enzyme. You shut the enzyme down by kind of using a back door. Instead of going after this active site and competing for it, it doesn't compete. It's non-competitive. It would rather take up this in, uh, regulatory, this allosteric site, change the whole shape of the enzyme, and shut it down that way. All right? So that's what this says here not competing for the enzyme's active site, interacting with some other part of the enzyme. Once the, the inhibitor kind of sits in there, doesn't do any kind of reactions, causes the enzyme to change shape, substrate no longer fits, 
and the enzyme can't do anything. You've completely shut down the enzyme. All right, so feel free to go back and catch up on what I went a little too quickly with.